I'll start to come to order here at the California Normal Conference on ending the 100-year drug war in California. host of other lovely volunteers here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And by the way, thank you to the Spark Dispensary, which had a wonderful party last night. Uh, in your conference books, there is a, a coupon good for 15% off, I believe, at Spark this weekend. So if you want to stop by, it's not very far from where the party tonight is going to happen. So, thanks to the good people at Spark. And we're really excited. We've got a lot of, of interesting speakers. We've got a lot of really important news to, uh, to talk about as this conference goes on, because uh, we're organizing to put an end to the war on cannabis right here, and it will happen. And it will happen to the help of all of you in this audience. Um, let me go into a few ground rules here first. As everybody knows, we are on federal property. Uh, so technically, medical cannabis is not respected on federal pot property. If you just step out that way and go through the fence, that's San Francisco. Well, uh, so we're ready to start the conference now. And we thought we'd start off on a historical note, what this is, in fact, the hundredth year that cannabis or marijuana has been illegal in California, uh, which is surprising to a lot of people because uh, you know a lot of people think that the war on marijuana started with the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 with Reefer Madness and Harry Anslinger. But that was at the federal level. Here in California, we were ahead of the rest of the country, and in 1913, cannabis was made illegal by some gentlemen at the State Board of Pharmacy. Before there even was a cannabis problem, it was invented. Um, I wanted to, we're gonna start off and talk a little bit about how we got here. You know, it's really pretty incredible when you think about it. About 100 years ago, you could still go in to any pharmacy and buy cannabis here in California or anywhere else in the United States. And in fact, uh, a little bit more than 100 years ago at least, you could buy opium, morphine, cocaine. In my grandparents' generation, when they were, you know, uh, college age and a little older, uh, all of these drugs were freely available over the counter without a prescription. And frankly, the, there wasn't much of a drug problem. But things began to change. We're going to go into how that happened. But first, I want to turn to Ellen Comp to discuss how things were before then here in California, uh, back in the good old days of the 19th century, when anybody could get cannabis, and it was no big deal. Now, it's very hard to find any information at all about cannabis use at that time. Uh, partly because it was no big deal. Uh, so there's been, <laughs> uh, it, it's taken a lot of research, a lot of research to ferret out what was actually going on. Ellen has been on top of that, and she will present some of her and our findings on this. Ellen? Thanks, Dale. Yeah, I think a lot of us are amateur historians in this because our history has been hidden from us. But we're starting to get more and more, partly because uh, California newspapers of the early days are starting to be digitized online and that sort of thing, and we're seeing more. Uh, hey, I also wanted to thank Denise Martellacci of Wheels of Compassion for the great coffee spread and fruit and everything. There'll be more thank yous to follow. Uh, yeah, as Dale said, cannabis was available in pharmacies uh, in the 1800s. And I don't think it took very long before people figured out that it did more for you than uh, what was on the label. Uh, there was a lot of uh, journalist adventurers going to the Far East, uh, um, 
Bayard Taylor was one who in 1854 published the first descriptions by an American of his experiences in Egypt and Damascus with, in beautiful language. Uh, shortly afterwards, in 1857, Fitzhugh Ludlow, who was the first American to have domestic experiences and write about it, and he was a very respected American journalist, worked for Horace Greeley, you know, go west young man and everything, and he traveled around and was a popular lecturer. And uh, his book, uh, he says, in his book he describes the cannabis user as one who is reaching for the soul's capacity for a broader being, deeper insight, grander views of beauty, truth, and good than she now gains through the chinks of her cell. Ludlow traveled to California in 1863, actually to San Francisco. And there he encountered a journalist who had just begun to call himself Mark Twain. Twain wrote to his mother to treat Ludlow well, should she ever encounter him, because Ludlow had written in the Golden Era newspaper that Twain makes me laugh more than any Californian. He is in a school by himself. In fact, he suggested Twain should focus on his humor rather than his straight news writing, which he was doing for the time for the San Francisco call. So two years later, on September 15th, or 18th, 1865, this item appeared in the San Francisco Dramatic Chronicle, which was the precursor to the San Francisco Chronicle. It says, it appears that a hashish mania has broken out among our bohemians. Yesterday, Mark Twain and the Mousetrap Man, that was another journalist, were seen walking up Clay Street under the influence of the drug, followed by a star who evidently was laboring under a misapprehension as to what was the matter with them. The star was probably a policeman. So at the corner of Clay and Samson Street, Near what is today Mark Twain Plaza at the base of the Transamerica building stood a pharmacy called Richard's Drugs, which in 1872 ran a series of ads, and these are some of them, for hashish candy. It starts with an ad for medical use, talks about hypochondriac sufferer physically and mentally in need of an invigorator, and then right away moves into recreational use as well with the phrase, all who are afflicted use hashish confection to find release relief. Those who seek for novelty use it for its exhilarating effects. Uh, and this is my favorite. Fanny, I did try the hashish. I will be there tonight, Fred. <laughs> uh, the picture over there is from a, an epic painting that hangs in the um, the Crocker Museum in Sacramento. It's by uh, William Hahn. It's called Street Scene Samson Street, and it was the first major painting of a contemporary California subject. And you can't see it very well in this slide, but, but uh, Richard's Drugs is actually the sign of which is depicted in this, in that, that glass uh, window is, is Richard's Drugs. Uh, next slide. What's there today is Mark Twain Plaza. There's a sign there for the street, and then there's this beautiful little Redwood Park. It's right at the base of the Transamerica building, and there's a, a frog pond in honor of Twain. Uh, Twain was one of many authors who sought a hashish experience also in the Middle East when he toured there in 1867, a couple years later. Uh, a collection of his travel letters, The Innocents Abroad, recounts a disappointing experience he had with a nargali in a Turkish bath in Constantinople. But a chapter not published in the book describes his impression of Alcazar, the palace of the Moorish kings, which he saw on his first morning in Seville after a night out on the town. He wrote, and this is in his hand, um, I cannot describe it. In my memory, its courts and gardens will also always be a hashish delusion. Its hall of ambassadors, a marvelous dream. Uh, he also um, mentioned hashish in a critique of a play called The White Fawn. Uh, the final scene was such a vision of magnificence such as no man could imagine unless he had eaten a barrel of hashish. <laughs> then we have, these are a couple of Dale's finds. Okay, 1895. 1895 we have reports in the newspaper of Arabs growing uh, hashish for sale in San Francisco, uh, either in Stockton or in Alameda or both. Next slide, I'll rush through these. We have this character, I just found this the other day, in Los Angeles, a kind of minor author named uh, Wallace Irwin, 
who uh, took a reporter down to a bar near the ambassador the Ambassador Hotel, no, the Alexandra Hotel in, in Los Angeles for a drink of hashish and sour milk. <clears throat> he was also uh, admired by Twain. Next, George Sterling. He is uh, the one who called San Francisco the cool gray city of love in a poem that I think inspired I Left My Heart in San Francisco. He achieved minor fame as a bohemian poet and presided over an artist colony in Carmel where hashish was taken. And one person he turned on was Jack London. And Jack London, of course, the, the most popular art writer of his day, Call of the Wild, this is what he wrote uh, about an experience he had with Sterling. Last night was like a thousand years. I was obsessed with indescribable sensations. Alternative visions of excessive happiness and oppressive moods of extreme sorrow. Uh, he, all, he wrote uh, about it in a couple different novels, Planchette, Martin Eden, where one of the characters is based on George Sterling. And uh, also in his book, John Barleycorn, which is his um, alcoholic memoirs devoted to his struggles with alcohol. He wrote about uh, hashish land and how difficult it was to describe. Ironically, that book, we won't even get into that, that book was written, um, was published in 1913, which is the year that the Board of Pharmacy made hashish illegal and alcohol not, not illegal. Thank you very much.